Hi, this is Elizabeth Goslin Mallow, the Europe correspondent for Defence News. We're here at DSCI this week, taking place in London. I have here with me Stephen Scott, who is the manager of Defence Labs at Mars. Welcome. Thank you. So we're here at one of the biggest trade shows in Europe. Can you take us a little bit on the background of the company, what you guys focus on? Yeah, sure. So Mars is a defence tech company. Um, we have quite a big presence in Europe and in the Middle East as well. Um, we focus primarily on uh, software and integrating third-party hardware. So we have a command and control software called NIDAR, um, which does sensor fusion of radars, cameras, sonars, a whole variety of sensors. We present all that to an operator in a very slick user interface that's very easy to learn and very easy to use, which helps reduce, reduce the cognitive burden for the operator. And then we can also integrate countermeasures into that. So uh, in the case of our counter US system, we can integrate third party effectors um, and uh, use that to defeat, uh, defeat uh, drone threats. And so the company is based in the UK. So our defense business is run out of the UK. Uh, we have a non-defense uh, part of the business, which is based in mainland Europe. And one of the big themes that has emerged this week at the show has been around drones, specifically drone interceptors, yep. one of which you guys are exhibiting at the show. Um, can you take us through essentially what that technology is um, and what it's used for? Sure. So we have the Mars Interceptor, um, which we're developing in-house. Uh, we've been developing it for a couple of years now. Essentially, um, the options for effectors that end users have tend to be fairly typical military systems. We wanted to develop a system that was dual use so that it could be used to um, protect civilian sites as well as military locations. So we came up with the idea of developing a, a drone interceptor, which in our case is a hybrid airframe. So it's a quadcopter combined with a fixed wing aircraft. That gives us uh, the benefits of both of those systems. So we can take off vertically, then we transition to fixed wing mode, like an airplane. Uh, we fly at extremely high speed, about 80 meters a second, which is about 288 kilometers an hour. Uh, and we directly impact into the target using kinetic energy. So there's no warhead on there, simply using kinetic energy for a head-on collision. And let's, let's Take us through a scenario. Uh, this faces, for example, another drone threat. How does it use kinetic energy to destroy or neutralize? Yeah, so um, basically, in order to maximize your kinetic energy, you're trying to fly fast. Um, it weighs around eight kilos. So you're trying to basically accelerate an eight kilogram mass um, as fast as you possibly can to maximize your energy. If you do a head-on collision with a target, the target also has kinetic energy, so you can combine the two together, and then that causes physical damage um, to, the, to the target. Um, depending on what the size of the target is, it will either cause damage to the interceptor as well, in which case it's a one-way mission, or for smaller targets, we would survive that engagement. Um, we can deploy a parachute if we need to, and the system can be recovered and reused um, for a later date. And what would you say is the main attraction um, from a customer standpoint to a system like a drone interceptor? Is it more affordable than certain traditional measures? Is it its capabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, cost per kill or cost per engagement was a key driver in the development. And we've had that on our requirements from the very beginning. If you compare it to the price of a Vishorad missile, which tends to be at least $100,000, sometimes more, um, versus the cost of the threat systems we're seeing. Um, it's just not really comparable. So actually, you have to try and change the financial metrics of each engagement. So we try and uh, drive the cost down of each interceptor so that it's less than the cost of the threat that it's defeating. Um, the targets against which it's reusable also helps with that metric as well. Um, in addition to that, one of the biggest benefits is you can abort the mission. So unlike if you fire a missile, is gone, you know, you've done it whether you change your mind or not, um, you still dispense with that missile. Uh, with the interceptor, you can abort the mission and it will return to base, you recharge it and it's ready to go. And what types of mission sets or what types of targets would it be more effective against, let's say? Yeah, so a broad range, we designed it primarily to defeat Shahid type targets, so like, we're um, in, in like we see a lot of at the moment, yeah, which have been a persistent threat in the Middle East for a number of years now, and that was our original use case. 
Of course, now we've seen Ukraine, it's Shahids, and then everything below that as well. So that's our target set there. And uh, what would you say this far from what you've observed this week and, you know, in the past couple of years with the company, what is the, where is the market going? What are some market trends? Where do you see this technology evolving in the next few years? Yeah, so we're definitely seeing a huge increase in the demand for interceptors as either an alternative to conventional missile systems or to work jointly with that as part of your layered air defense solution. Um, the price is obviously a key, a key driver there, the availability of it, um, the ability to use it in uh, civilian contexts as well. So without the warhead, reduces your collateral damage risk and your risk to, to, um, to, to civilians as well. Um, the drone threat is multiplying globally. We, we said this a number of years ago, that the threat we were seeing in the Middle East five, six, seven years ago was only going to proliferate. We're now seeing that, um, you know, in Europe, obviously. Uh, but actually, uh, domestically as well, we're going to probably start to see a lot more hostile drones, people taking inspiration for what they're seeing on social media in particular. Um, and using them, you know, whether it's an individual or whether it's a state or, a, you know, um, a, another company or something like that who's using them in a hostile way. So the marketplace for counter drone systems is is definitely increasing. And what do you think we can expect from from this market in in the next couple of years? Is it going to be absolutely booming as an, a more affordable option than you know traditional countermeasure sets? I think I think what we'll definitely see is much more interceptor drones available. So and you know there's there's a number that are in development as well as ours. We're quite far ahead, I think, in terms of maturity. We've been doing it for a few years. We also have the benefit of using a lot of our technology from our ground-based system, particularly our AI and machine learning. So actually we've built a very intelligent, very uh, capable drone system. There'll definitely be more of them. I think the demand is is probably, the market is probably going to be able to cope with more interceptors than just the one we're developing. But I like to think that we're going to be at the forefront of that marketplace. Um, in terms of sales forecasts, you know, when we're when we're talking to some of our existing customers who run our, our county US system, you know, they're talking about buying not just ones or twos, it's like thousands of them they need. And so the market potential there is, is quite substantial over the next five years. And last but not least, obviously, autonomy AI is a hot topic right now. Is there any uh, sort of AI functions that are part of the drone interceptor that you're showing this week? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, our ground-based system already uses uh, machine learning-based computer vision models. We've essentially taken a subset of that capability, which normally runs on a server rack, and we've actually condensed it down so that it can run on each individual interceptor. So we're adding a lot of intelligence. The interceptor itself is fully autonomous, so the operator doesn't need to fly it manually, which helps massively with training burden. It also means that that operator can manage multiple interceptors simultaneously, unlike, say, a conventional missile system where they might actually only be able to do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it means their training burden is very low. Um, and all of the intelligence is in the interceptor, but of course the operator has the ability to abort the mission and supervises it from beginning to end. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and have a good rest of your week. You too, thank you.